Hello everyone, and welcome to Midnight Echoes. This video is meant to help you relax, unwind, or maybe even drift off to sleep. So before you get too cozy, I'd love to know where you're listening from, and what time it is in your part of the world. So feel free to share in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe if you've enjoyed the episodes. I was just an average guy from the city, going through what felt like the motions of an uninspired life. I had no family nearby, and my job as an assistant editor for a small publisher in Chicago was so far removed from what I had envisioned for myself. I spent hours each day hunched over a computer screen, plotting through manuscripts and editing lines. So, when I finally took a vacation, I decided I'd do something out of character. I booked a solo camping trip to Shawnee National Forest, a sprawling wilderness tucked away in southern Illinois. I'd read about the dense woods, steep ridges, and the solitude the area offered, and that appealed to me. A friend who loved hiking had once joked that Shawnee was the perfect place to lose yourself. A line I'd laughed at, but now, in hindsight, felt too close to reality. I figured a week of hiking, sleeping under the stars, and just breathing in fresh air would be the kind of reset I needed. Shawnee is vast and raw, dense with trees that stretch up like ancient sentinels guarding the land. The forest is a mix of towering oaks, winding trails, and streams that cut through steep ravines, the kind of place where even a seasoned hiker could lose track of time or sense of direction. I camped at Garden of the Gods, a stunning area known for its dramatic rock formations that had drawn photographers for years. The trail I'd chosen was supposed to be straightforward, looping back to my base camp after passing some scenic overlooks. At first, it was everything I'd hoped for. Quiet, secluded, just me and the trees, the sky, and the occasional rustle of a squirrel or chirp of a bird. The silence was calming, like a weight lifting from my shoulders. My only companion was a borrowed guidebook on foraging. It was something I'd picked up out of curiosity. I liked the idea of living off the land, even if I didn't actually intend to survive on wild plants alone. It was just a nice idea. Something to explore in the quiet moments. But a creeping sense of unease began to seep in, slow and subtle. Every now and then, I'd get the feeling I was being watched. A branch snapped somewhere behind me, and I'd turn, expecting to see someone, but there was nothing. Just trees stretching on in every direction, as though they were shifting when I wasn't looking. I brushed it off, blaming the isolation. I told myself, it was the isolation playing tricks on my mind. I hadn't anticipated how lonely it could feel in the middle of such vast wilderness. That was when I met Jake, a local forager who seemed to know every inch of Shawnee. He was a man in his fifties, rough around the edges, with a scruffy beard. Jake had calloused hands that looked like they could break a branch in half without effort. He introduced himself with an easy grin asking if I was doing okay out there on my own. Jake seemed friendly enough, almost too friendly. But maybe I was just cautious, because he was the only person I'd seen in hours. He wore a beaten down jacket and carried a heavy looking satchel that I assumed was full of herbs or plants he'd foraged. He pointed out various edible plants as we walked, showing me leaves and stems that looked all the same to me, but apparently held subtle, nutritious differences. He had an easy, almost hypnotic way of talking, and it was clear he loved the forest, knew it intimately. I've been coming here for decades, he said, as if to reassure me. Used to live out here for weeks at a time, just me and the land. He showed me some wild garlic, a plant he called wood sorrel. He even gave me a few berries, saying, eat up. Nature's got plenty for us. I tried to be polite, nodding along as he explained which plants were edible and which ones would send me to an early grave. He seemed genuine enough, and I figured he probably thought he was doing me a favor. But something about his enthusiasm unsettled me, like he was sizing me up, 
trying to gauge my level of survival knowledge. As we continued walking, Jake pointed to my water bottle and laughed. That's not going to last you too long out here, friend, he said. If you're planning to hike all week, you'll need more than that. I told him I had a small water filter, and he nodded approvingly, though I caught a strange glint in his eye. The next morning, I woke up to find my water filter missing. I rummaged through my backpack, double-checking every pocket, but it was nowhere. It didn't make sense. I knew I'd packed it. I hadn't moved it since setting up camp. The unsettling thought that maybe someone had taken it crossed my mind, but I dismissed it as paranoid. Perhaps I'd just dropped it somewhere along the trail. When I ran into Jake later that day, I casually mentioned the missing filter, hoping for a clue or a tip on where I could refill. He just smiled, a little too long, before saying, that's tough but you'll figure it out. You seem resourceful. His words didn't sit well with me. That glint in his eye, the smile that felt a beat too long, it all came back to me with a chill. But I told myself he couldn't have known about the filter. It was probably just bad luck, nothing more. I kept going, pushing forward on my hike, but an uneasy feeling grew with every mile. I tried to shake it off, ignoring the paranoia creeping in. I filled my water bottle from a small stream and reminded myself that accidents happen. I just have to be careful with the rest of my gear and keep a close eye on my belongings. As the days wore on, strange things kept happening. My food supply seemed to dwindle faster than expected. At first I thought I was just being careless, not counting my rations closely enough. But then, my lighter went missing, and I noticed small cuts in the lining of my tent, barely noticeable, but enough to let the cold air seep in at night. The more it happened, the harder it was to convince myself that these were just accidents. The next time I saw Jake, he seemed almost amused. He offered me a bundle of dried meat, saying, It's tough out here, you can't always count on your gear. His tone was too casual too familiar. I took the meat reluctantly, forcing myself to nod in thanks, but my stomach twisted as I chewed it. It became clear that Jake was orchestrating these mishaps. He was testing me, watching my reactions, gauging my ability to survive under worsening conditions. The realization was sickening, and I felt my heart pound as I struggled to keep my composure. I didn't want him to know that I was onto him that I knew what he was doing, but there was no denying it anymore. This wasn't bad luck, it was a calculated game. As the days passed, I could feel myself growing weaker. I rationed what little food I had left, trying to stretch it out, but Jake's generosity seemed to have dried up. He'd stopped offering food or advice, and when he did show up, he'd merely watch. A slight smirk on his face, as if I were some sort of entertainment. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that this was no chance encounter. Jake had planned this. He'd probably been watching me long before I'd ever known he was there, sizing me up, making notes on my skills or lack thereof. Each item that went missing, every piece of equipment that broke, was part of his twisted game, a test to see how far he could push me before I broke. I felt a surge of anger, fueled by desperation and exhaustion, but I kept it buried deep, knowing I couldn't afford to show any sign of weakness. One evening, as I sat by a small fire, nursing the last of my rations, Jake appeared out of the shadows, silent as a ghost. Running low on food, aren't you? He asked, his tone casual, almost friendly. I glared at him. Unable to hide my contempt any longer. What do you want from me, Jake? I demanded, my voice strained. He chuckled, as if the question amused him. I want to see if you're strong enough, he said, crouching down by the fire. Most people give up. They whine. They panic. But you, you've lasted longer than most. His words sank in, and I felt my skin crawl. He was toying with me testing my limits, watching to see when I would break. It wasn't survival to him, 
It was a game. Jake reached into his satchel, pulling out a small, worn notebook. He flipped through the pages, showing me sketches and notes, each one detailing other campers he'd watched, tested, and left to fend for themselves. Some pages had photos, faded, grainy snapshots of people huddled under makeshift shelters, their faces hollow, eyes haunted. Why, I whispered, feeling a mixture of horror and rage. Jake shrugged, an eerie smile spreading across his face. Survival of the fittest, he replied. I like to see who's worthy, who can handle the forest. Those who make it out become part of my collection. He held up the notebook, as if I should be proud to be added to his twisted list of worthy survivors. Rage boiled over, and I lunged at him, my fists clenched. But Jake sidestepped me with practiced ease, grabbing my wrist and twisting until I felt a sharp, searing pain shoot through my arm. He shoved me to the ground, his face inches from mine, his expression cold and unfeeling. You don't get to fight back, he said softly. You either survive, or you don't. That's the rule. I felt my strength waning, the days of starvation and exhaustion catching up with me. But the thought of giving up, of becoming another name in his sick notebook, filled me with a surge of defiance. I scrambled to my feet, backing away slowly. My eyes locked on his, searching for any sign of vulnerability. Jake simply watched, an amused glint in his eyes, as though he were daring me to make a move. Desperation took over, and I snatched a burning branch from the fire, wielding it like a weapon. Jake's smirk faltered, and I saw a flicker of surprise. Get away from me, I hissed, brandishing the branch. He laughed, a low, unsettling sound, but he took a step back, his gaze never leaving mine. Fine, he said, raising his hands in a mock surrender. I'll give you a head start. But remember, I know this forest better than anyone. I'll be watching. With that, he disappeared into the shadows, leaving me alone by the dying fire, my heart racing. I knew I couldn't trust him. This was just another test, another part of his game. I doused the fire, plunging myself into darkness, and began to move silently through the trees. Hoping to put as much distance between us as possible, every sound, every snap of a twig, made me jump. But I forced myself to stay focused, my mind racing as I tried to think of a way out. I remembered a stream I'd passed earlier, a narrow, winding path through the forest. It would be nearly impossible to track. I moved quickly, my heart pounding, as I made my way toward it, praying that Jake was too far behind to follow. The forest felt alive, every shadow a potential threat, every rustle a reminder that he could be just behind me. The hours blurred together as I ran, my muscles screaming, my lungs burning, but I refused to stop. Finally, as dawn broke, I stumbled onto a gravel road, the sight of civilization both a relief and a shock. I looked back, half expecting to see Jake emerging from the trees. But there was nothing, only the silent, endless stretch of forest. I kept running, my steps echoing against the gravel until I reached a small ranger station down the road. The rangers listened to my story, their faces a mixture of shock and disbelief. They took my report, nodding grimly. But I knew, deep down, that Jake would never be caught. He was a ghost in that forest, a predator who knew his territory too well. I made it out alive, but something inside me had changed. The woods had once been a place of peace a refuge from the grind of daily life. But now, every rustling leaf, every distant crunch of a branch, brought back memories of those nights in Shawnee. Jake's face, that cold, detached gaze, lingered in my mind, like a scar. For weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that he was still watching me, that somehow, he'd followed me out of the forest. I'd find myself glancing over my shoulder on quiet streets, convinced I'd see him lurking in the shadows. My friends told me it was just paranoia, 
a lingering effect of the trauma, but I knew better. Jake was a patient hunter, and his game wasn't over just because I'd escaped. In time, I returned to my normal routine, back to the computer screen, the manuscripts, the noise of the city. But the fear lingered, a quiet reminder of what I'd endured. I avoided wooded areas, refused invitations to hikes, and steered clear of anything remotely resembling adventure. I'd survived Jake's test, but I'd left part of myself behind in that forest. I never went camping again. Shani was off limits, and the idea of open wilderness became more nightmare than dream. Friends would ask me about that week, and I'd laugh it off, giving vague answers. Never letting on what really happened. To them, I was just another office worker who'd tried and failed to find himself in the woods. But some nights, when the city was quiet and I was alone, I'd catch a shadow flickering by my window or hear the distant snap of a branch. And my heart would race. Jake had his trophies, his journal of survivors, and I was one of them. But deep down, I knew that for him, it wasn't enough. The game was still in play, and he was somewhere out there, watching, waiting. In the end, survival wasn't triumph. It was just another chapter in his twisted hunt, and as I drifted into uneasy sleep, I couldn't help but wonder if, one day, he'd return to finish the game he'd started. Next story. We were an ordinary couple, or at least, I wanted to believe we were. Emily and I had been together for five years, and things had grown predictable. We both felt it. Weekends spent in the same cafes, Friday nights with the same friends, conversations that fell into familiar patterns. I knew I wasn't the only one who felt that we'd been treading water. I held on to the hope that a change of scene would reignite the spark we once shared. Emily had suggested a camping trip as an adventure, something different. She'd found a remote campground in Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Park, an area barely marked on our map but known for its secluded beauty. It seemed perfect. A few days alone in the wilderness, away from the noise and monotony, might be just what we needed. We could hike, camp under the stars, and maybe remember what had brought us together in the first place. The National Park was both breathtaking and intimidating, with its towering pine trees, dense trails, and occasional clearings. The clearings sometimes opened up to jaw-dropping mountain views. We were aiming for a campsite at the edge of a cliff, one of those rare scenic spots people talk about, but few venture to find. According to Emily's research, it was off the beaten path, a local's only secret for hikers willing to stray from the main trails. Our starting point was one of the last stops before hitting the backcountry, where trails become scarce and wildlife reigns. We'd packed our backpacks with enough food, water, and gear for a few days. Emily had even convinced me to buy a small, lightweight tent, something practical and easy to set up. I could tell she was excited. Her eyes sparkled with that familiar, adventurous spirit I'd first fallen for. It was supposed to be a break, an escape from the monotony of our lives. I didn't know why, but I couldn't shake an odd sense of foreboding as we set out. It was subtle, easy to ignore, like the quiet hum of an engine in silence. Still, I brushed it aside. There was no reason to be uneasy. It was just us, alone in the wilderness, and the thrill of the unknown. I noticed that Emily's excitement was contagious. Her smile lifted my mood, and soon, I was focused on the trail ahead, the cool mountain air, and the sharp scent of pine. I even started to look forward to the quiet, a kind of reset button for our relationship. But in the back of my mind, I couldn't ignore that odd feeling that settled into the pit of my stomach, faint yet persistent, like an instinct warning me that we might not be as alone as we thought. The first day of the hike passed with relative ease. We followed the narrow trail as it wound through the forest, our footsteps crunching against fallen leaves and stray twigs. We passed only a few hikers, all heading in the opposite direction, 
as though we were the last ones venturing deeper into the forest that day. We exchanged pleasantries, but each time we continued, I felt the silence around us grow heavier, a kind of quiet that swallowed the world whole. By late afternoon, we reached a clearing beside a shallow stream. Emily took out the map, her fingers tracing a faint line to a spot marked with a small X she'd penciled in. The viewpoint should be another hour or two from here, she said, glancing up at me. Her enthusiasm was still present, though I could sense a hint of fatigue creeping into her voice. We'd been hiking for hours, and the trail was harder than either of us had anticipated. Yet, the idea of a scenic overlook kept us moving forward. As we crossed the stream, the trail became even fainter, almost invisible beneath a layer of fallen branches and thick underbrush. We stumbled through, pushing branches aside and stepping over rocks, until finally, we arrived at a narrow ridge that opened up to a stunning view of the valley below. Emily gasped, her face lighting up in awe. It's perfect, she whispered, and I had to agree. It felt like we'd stumbled upon something truly hidden, a view few would ever see. As we began to set up camp, I noticed something strange. Half buried in the soil, barely visible beneath a patch of ferns, was an old, weathered camera. It looked like it had been lying there for a while, with patches of rust creeping over its metal frame. Hey, look at this, I called out, pulling it from the dirt. Emily turned, curiosity sparking in her eyes. That's an old model, she said, taking it from my hands. Wonder how long it's been here. I examined the camera. It felt oddly heavy, as though it carried a kind of history with it. The screen was cracked, but as I fiddled with it, I realized the memory card was still intact. A wave of unease washed over me, but I pushed it down, telling myself it was just an ordinary item left behind. We should check it out, Emily suggested, a glint of excitement in her eyes. Maybe we can see what kind of pictures they took here. I shrugged, feeling a bit reluctant but unable to resist her enthusiasm. Sure, I replied, trying to sound nonchalant. That night, after we'd eaten and settled by the fire, Emily pulled out her laptop. She inserted the memory card. I watched as she clicked through the photos, one by one. The first few images were typical camping shots, a couple smiling in front of the mountains, cozy around a campfire, sitting on a fallen tree by the stream. They looked happy, carefree, and oddly familiar. Something about them tugged at my memory. It was as though I'd seen faces like theirs a hundred times before. Emily zoomed in on one of the photos. They camped right here, she said, her voice filled with wonder. I recognized the exact spot. It was the very ridge we were sitting on. My eyes drifted to the trees in the background, comparing them to the ones around us. It was surreal, like we were staring into a mirror of our own lives. Then, the photos started to change. The couple looked increasingly tense, their faces strained, as though something unseen was weighing on them. I could see them huddled close, glancing over their shoulders their expressions shifting from carefree smiles to haunted stares. My chest tightened as I scrolled through each image, feeling an inexplicable dread settle over me. Emily grew quiet, her fingers hovering over the keyboard as she examined a series of images showing the couple's tent torn open, its fabric ripped and flapping in the wind. Another photo showed the woman's face, bruised and streaked with dirt. She was staring directly into the camera, with wide, terrified eyes. This, this is too much, I muttered, feeling a chill run through me. Emily didn't answer. She just stared at the screen, her face pale. What happened to them? She whispered, almost to herself. I didn't have an answer, but the images told a story of fear and isolation. It was a descent into terror that felt all too real. We flipped to the last photo, our breaths catching in our throats. The couple stood in front of what looked like our tent, their faces obscured by shadows. My stomach dropped. It was unmistakable. They were looking directly at the camera, as though they'd been posing for us. 
A heavy silence filled the air after we saw the final photo. Neither of us moved, our eyes locked on the screen, our thoughts racing. The questions we didn't want to ask hung between us, unspoken yet deafening. Who were they? Why were they posing in front of a tent that looked exactly like ours? I could almost feel their eyes, watching us from within the shadows of the trees. Emily broke the silence, her voice shaky. It has to be a coincidence, she murmured, though her words felt forced. She clutched her arms tightly, her usual confidence stripped away. But something inside me resisted that explanation. It wasn't just a random resemblance. Everything, their poses, the setting, even the bruises and the expressions, seemed deliberate, as though we were meant to see these images, to understand their fear, and that last photo. It was as if they knew we'd be here, watching their final moments, seeing the dread that consumed them. The night stretched on, the fire crackling softly, casting long shadows that danced around our campsite. I forced myself to shake off the paranoia. They were just photos, eerie, yes, but only pictures of strangers who had once camped here. They couldn't harm us, but as the hours crept by, I couldn't shake the feeling. It felt like we weren't alone. Every rustle in the bushes made my heart race. Every crack of a twig made me sit up, straining my ears for any sign of life beyond the circle of light. Did you hear that? Emily's voice was barely a whisper, her face pale as she scanned the darkness. I nodded, feeling the weight of silence. It pressed against my chest. The fire's glow offered little comfort. It only deepened the shadows beyond its reach, transforming every branch, every bush, into a lurking figure. Suddenly, the beam of a flashlight cut through the darkness, illuminating a distant figure standing at the edge of the clearing. They were barely visible, shrouded in shadow, but their outline was unmistakable. A man, still as a statue, his face hidden beneath the brim of a hat. I froze my breath catching in my throat as Emily clutched my arm. Who's there? I called out, my voice trembling despite my effort to sound steady. The figure didn't respond. They simply stood there, unmoving, watching us. Then, with an unsettling slowness, they lifted a camera, the flash illuminating their face for a split second. I could make out nothing but a hollow stare, a face drained of life, but etched with intent. Emily and I scrambled to our feet. We grabbed our things in a panicked frenzy. The figure lowered the camera and began to walk forward, slow and deliberate. I could feel my pulse racing, every instinct screaming to run, to get away from whatever was approaching. We stumbled through the trees, adrenaline taking over as we dashed down the path. We hoped to put as much distance between us and that figure as possible. But the forest felt endless, a maze of twisted paths and dense foliage. Our flashlights flickered in the dark, barely illuminating the ground in front of us. I could hear Emily's breaths coming in sharp, frantic gasps beside me. I knew she was just as terrified as I was. Every few steps, I glanced back, half expecting to see that figure following us. But the darkness swallowed everything beyond the narrow beam of my flashlight. We ran blindly, the branches clawing at us, the sound of snapping twigs filling my ears. Then, ahead, another beam of light appeared, a second figure, standing in our path, holding a camera in their hands. Emily screamed, pulling me to the side as we veered off the trail, crashing through the underbrush. The figures multiplied, their shapes becoming silhouettes in the distance. They were always ahead of us blocking our path, driving us deeper into the woods. Every time we turned, every path we took, they were there, silent and watchful, as if guiding us toward something inevitable. We stumbled into a small clearing, gasping for breath. I scanned the area, hoping for an escape room. But all I could see were trees and the shadows lurking within them. The figures circled the clearing, closing in, their cameras raised flashes going off intermittently, blinding us with bursts of light. 
Desperation took over. Leave us alone, I shouted, my voice cracking. But the figures remained silent. Their cameras clicked in unison, the light searing into my vision each time. I realized then that they weren't trying to hurt us, not physically. They were capturing us, documenting our fear, as if we were part of some twisted experiment. The truth hit me like a punch. They wanted us to feel what they'd felt. They wanted us to experience the terror they'd captured in those photos. Emily grabbed my hand, her eyes wide with terror. We have to get out of here, she whispered, and I could see the same realization dawning on her face. We turned, and bolted in the opposite direction, ducking beneath branches. We tripped over roots, determined to escape this nightmare. The cameras flashed behind us, relentless, like the pulsing light of a distant storm. But with every step, I could feel them closing in, the flashes becoming more frequent, more intense, as though they were feeding off our desperation. We burst through the trees, finally finding the main trail. I looked back one last time, but the figures had vanished leaving only the echoes of their laughter and the residual light from their flashes imprinted in my mind. My heart hammered in my chest, but a strange calm settled over me as I realized that we'd escaped. We stumbled down the trail, clutching each other for support as the reality of what had happened set in. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see those figures lurking in the shadows. But the forest was silent again, as if it had swallowed them whole the flashes, the hollow stares, the relentless chase. It all felt like a fever dream, something too surreal to be true. By the time we reached the car, dawn was breaking, casting a pale light over the mountains, transforming the dark and foreboding forest into something almost peaceful. Emily and I climbed in without a word, our bodies aching, our minds racing. I turned the key desperate to leave that place behind. As we drove down the winding mountain road, I tried to make sense of what we'd experienced. The photos, the figures, the relentless pursuit. It was like they had wanted us to feel the fear, to document it, as if we were the final subjects in some twisted project. And in some sick, perverse way, they'd succeeded. I looked over at Emily, her face pale and drawn her eyes fixed on the road ahead, as if she, too, was trying to leave the memory of that night behind. But something in her gaze told me, she'd never truly forget it. That night, we'd seen the darkness that lurks within people. The cruelty that waits just beneath the surface, ready to consume anyone unfortunate enough to stumble upon it. Months passed, and though we rarely spoke about it, I could feel the weight of that experience lingering between us. We'd escaped with our lives, but I knew we'd left something behind in that forest. A part of ourselves would always belong to that place, to those faces in the shadows. Sometimes, when I close my eyes, I see the flash of a camera, a fleeting image of Emily and me, frozen in fear, staring out from the screen. I imagine the figures watching us, smiling in the darkness as they wait for their next visitor. They're waiting for someone to wander into the trap, to become part of their twisted experiment. The forest keeps its secrets well, hiding them behind its trees in silence. And as we drove away, leaving that place far behind, I couldn't help but feel that we'd merely survived, not escaped. Someday, we might see those faces again, waiting just beyond the edge of the light. Next story. I was part of a group of six friends, each sharing a love for nature, but from different backgrounds. We planned this trip for months, a weekend getaway to the peaceful, unspoiled trails of Shenandoah National Park, just outside Virginia. There was Sam, the planner, whose fascination with finding untouched trails led us here. Greg, the jokester, kept morale high from the beginning. Emma and Chris were the couple among us, glued to each other, as they usually were, though they never shied from roughing it with us. Maya was quiet, an artist who preferred observing to talking. And then, there was me. Observant, a bit cautious, 
but drawn to the group's camaraderie and shared sense of adventure. Shenandoah allured us with its sprawling landscapes, thick forests, and trails ranging from well-trodden paths to almost hidden routes. We started early on Saturday, backpacks full, our spirits high as the morning sun broke over the dense canopy. Sam had chosen a trail marked in an obscure hiking blog as untouched. Far from the park's main trails, barely marked on the map. The morning began with laughter, Greg cracking jokes about Maya's mountain of art supplies, and Chris acting as if he were a hardened wilderness man. Yet, there was a subtle undercurrent I couldn't ignore. As we started, I couldn't shake an odd feeling that sat in the pit of my stomach. We'd all read up on the hike and packed, but the path was narrower than expected, and the forest seemed denser. The deeper we ventured, the thicker the silence became. We'd pause, hearing nothing but the rustle of leaves, or the occasional snap of a twig. Our laughter gradually diminishing as we felt the forest close in around us. As we climbed further, I found myself keeping to the back of the group, watching Sam's confident strides leading us forward. His sense of direction had always been sharp, but even he seemed thrown off by the lack of trail markers. A few hours in, we reached a small clearing, and that's when we saw him. The ranger appeared as if out of nowhere, startling us. Tall, lean, and dressed in an old ranger's uniform, he looked like he belonged here, the forest's shadows clinging to him. He wore a faded brown hat, his face shadowed but his eyes sharp and bright. You all are quite far from the usual paths, he said, his voice deep and calm, carrying a strange authority that immediately held our attention. Just following the trail, Sam replied, a bit defensively. The ranger chuckled, shaking his head. That's not a trail, he pointed out. But I know one. Takes you to the overlook, and brings you back down safely. Far better than wandering out here. We exchanged glances. The man seemed legitimate, confident in a way that made him instantly trustworthy. Sam looked relieved. His assurance wavered just enough for him to consider the ranger's offer. After a quick, quiet debate among ourselves, we decided to follow him. As he led us deeper into the forest, I began to feel a growing unease that I couldn't explain. Something about his confidence felt unsettling, as if he knew this forest far better than any ranger should. At first, the new path seemed promising. The ranger moved with a precision that bordered on eerie, as if he knew every rock and root along the way. We followed him, weaving through dense clusters of trees and slipping along narrow ledges where the ground sloped downward into darkness. I couldn't shake the feeling that the path was unlike any official trail I'd ever seen. There were no markers, no signs of previous hikers, not even the natural indicators of a well-traveled path. The day was wearing on, and though Sam tried to keep up conversation, the ranger barely responded, his voice dropping to a murmur. Not many come out here anymore he muttered as we passed a gnarled oak. Its branches twisted in grotesque shapes. Used to be my main route, kept folks from wandering too far. An odd shiver passed through me. How long have you been a ranger? I asked, hoping to break the quiet. He glanced back, his eyes unreadable. Long enough, he replied, not slowing his pace. Greg, always up for a laugh, whispered to me. He's a real chatterbox, huh? But his grin didn't reach his eyes. About an hour later, we noticed the first troubling sign. We reached a narrow pass between two rocky outcrops, where the trees seemed to thin out. Scattered across the ground were items. A small, rusted tin canteen, a torn muddy jacket, and a worn-out hiking boot that seemed decades old. The sight was out of place. None of it looked recent. The ranger, however, barely glanced at them. Old camping gear, he commented dismissively, nudging a half-buried backpack with the toe of his boot. People get careless out here. Emma raised her voice, her tone strained. What happened to them? The ranger paused, his face unreadable. Accidents happen, 
he said simply. It's why I stay out here. Then he turned and continued down the path, leaving us standing there in uneasy silence. Sam, looking at the rest of us, shrugged. It's probably nothing. People do leave things behind. Let's just keep moving. But I could tell he was shaken. I felt annoying anxiety taking root. My mind raced through all the strange details, pieces of a puzzle that didn't seem to fit together. The way he'd appeared so suddenly, his silence when we tried to make small talk, his evasive answers. I was tempted to suggest we turn back, but something held me back, maybe a sense of not wanting to seem paranoid. Instead, I stayed close to the others, my gaze flickering between the ranger and the path. It wasn't long before the horror started to unfold. As we descended a particularly steep slope, Greg, who was right behind the ranger, slipped and almost went tumbling down the hill. The ranger reached out and grabbed him by the shoulder, steadying him with a firm grip. Careful now, he said, his voice cold. One wrong step, and you'll find yourself lost out here. The words hit me like a warning, chillingly final. From then on, none of us wanted to fall behind. We moved as one tight group, huddled close together, as if afraid of something lurking in the shadows of the forest. The ranger led us through dense woods and overgrown trails, and I felt my sense of direction slipping. It was as if the forest itself had closed in around us. The light was beginning to fade, and the forest grew darker, casting eerie shadows along the path. That was when we noticed Emma and Chris weren't with us anymore. One moment they'd been right behind us, talking quietly to each other, and the next, they were simply gone. Emma, Chris. Sam called out, his voice edged with panic. We all turned, looking around frantically. The ranger barely stopped. Keep moving, he ordered, his voice sharper now, almost cold. The forest can take people before they even know they're lost. What? I asked, unable to hide the edge of panic in my voice. Shouldn't we go back and look for them? They'll find their way, he said with a strange finality, glancing over his shoulder at me. His face was expressionless, his eyes unnervingly calm. I felt a surge of fear, a visceral reaction that tightened my throat. I reached out to grab Sam's arm. This isn't right, I whispered urgently. We need to go back. Emma and Chris. They wouldn't just disappear. Sam shook his head, his voice strained. We don't know where we are. If we leave the trail now, we'll all get lost. The ranger knows what he's doing. We just, we need to stick together. But something about that decision filled me with dread. I looked back at Greg and Maya, who were huddled close together their faces pale and their eyes wide with fear. As the sky darkened further, our pace grew slower. The forest around us felt alive, watching us, breathing down our necks. The ranger's shadowy figure was a constant, unchanging silhouette ahead of us, leading us deeper into what felt like the forest's heart. Another hour passed, and the ranger suddenly stopped. This is it, he said, gesturing to a clearing up ahead. We entered the space cautiously, our flashlights casting eerie beams. But there was no overlook, no scenic view, no grand reveal, just a small clearing. The ground littered with scraps of fabric, old hiking gear, and what looked horrifyingly like an abandoned campfire, its ashes undisturbed. Sam was the first to speak, his voice barely a whisper. Where's the overlook? The ranger smiled. His expression twisted into something unreadable. You're standing on it, he replied softly, his eyes glinting in the flashlight beams. My breath hitched. Something was very wrong. I could feel it, a cold certainty settling in my stomach. I turned to Sam, panic spreading on his face. A silent understanding passed between us. We'd followed him into a trap, deeper into the forest, and now, Emma and Chris were missing. We have to go, I whispered, barely able to keep my voice steady. I didn't wait for his response. I grabbed Maya's hand, yanking her toward the narrow path we'd come from. Leaving already. 
The ranger called after us, his voice almost playful. I didn't dare look back. We pushed through the darkness, our breaths coming in sharp, ragged gasps as we stumbled over roots and branches. I knew we were running blind, but any path away from him was better than staying there. As we fled, a horrifying thought clawed its way into my mind. The ranger hadn't been guiding us to safety. He'd been leading us here, one step at a time, separating us and leaving us vulnerable. The old gear, the scraps of fabric scattered in the clearing, they weren't just discarded items, they were remnants. Remnants of others who'd fallen for his twisted game. The realization hit like a punch to the gut. He wasn't a ranger anymore, not in any official sense. He was a predator, using the guise of authority to lead unsuspecting hikers to a remote, isolated fate. The full scope of the ranger's plan became horrifyingly clear. We stumbled through the forest in darkness, trying to escape the fate that had taken Emma and Chris. My pulse pounded in my ears, each beat amplifying the dread settling into my bones. The ranger was out there somewhere, his footsteps a barely perceptible rhythm behind us, moving stealthily, as if he'd done this countless times before. We hurried through the underbrush, our breaths ragged, and our flashlight beams flickering in the dark. Suddenly, Greg stumbled, letting out a muffled scream as he fell into a pit concealed beneath leaves and branches. I ran to the edge, heart pounding, and shone my flashlight down. It was about five feet deep. Not enough to kill, but more than enough to injure. Greg clutched his ankle, grimacing in pain, unable to stand. He planned this, I whispered horror-struck. The realization struck me with brutal clarity. The traps, the abandoned gear, the chilling smile he'd given us as we left the clearing. He wanted us separated. Sam tried to pull Greg out, but with his ankle sprained, he was slowing us down. Maya clutched my arm, trembling, and I could feel the desperation radiating off her. We had to keep moving, but we couldn't leave Greg behind. Not like this. That's when we heard his voice. The ranger's low, menacing tone. It carried through the trees. You thought you could just leave. That I'd let you go. His voice was calm, even casual, as if he were having a pleasant conversation with us. But every word dripped with malice. It's a shame about your friends. You know. They put up quite a fight. The words ignited a fury in me. A sudden defiance pushing past my fear. Why are you doing this? I shouted, barely able to control the shake in my voice. We trusted you. There was a silence, thick and stifling, before he replied. Justice, he said, as if that explained everything. You hikers come here every year, trampling the land, treating it like your personal playground. I'm just restoring the balance. I'm giving you a taste of what it's like to be abandoned. We exchanged terrified glances. There was no negotiating with someone who believed they were serving some twisted sense of justice. Sam and I helped Greg up, his arms slung over our shoulders, as we struggled to move quickly. We heard the ranger moving through the brush behind us, methodical and relentless, his footsteps falling with the precision of a hunter tracking wounded prey. The forest around us felt alien its branches reaching out like skeletal fingers. In a desperate attempt, Sam spotted a narrow slope that seemed to lead toward a small river. Down there, he whispered urgently, pointing. We half dragged, half carried Greg down the slope, hoping the water would obscure our tracks. The ranger's voice called out behind us, amused. Running won't help. You'll get lost. Before you find your way out, his words echoed, taunting, reminding us how deep we were in the heart of the wilderness. We reached the riverbank, the cold water biting into our skin as we waded in, moving downstream as fast as we could, hoping the ranger wouldn't be able to track us in the current. My heart pounded as the water rushed around us. Our feet slipped on smooth stones and submerged roots. Greg winced with each step, his ankles swelling, but he pressed on. 
his face set in grim determination. Just when I thought we'd put some distance between us and the ranger, he emerged from the shadows on the opposite bank, watching us with that unsettling calm. His eyes locked onto mine, and for the first time, I saw a flicker of frustration cross his face. You're making this harder than it has to be, he called, his voice eerily steady. Come back, and I might just let one of you go. Panic surged through me, but I forced myself to think. Ahead of us, the river's current picked up speed, leading into what looked like rapids. It was dangerous, but I knew it might be our only chance. I gestured to Sam and Greg. We have to go down the rapids. He won't follow us there. Sam nodded, understanding the risk, but recognizing the urgency. We waded forward, the current pulling us faster now. The sound of the rushing water grew louder, drowning out our breaths and the ranger's taunts. I took one last look back, and there he was, standing on the bank, watching us with an expression that chilled me to my core. The current pulled us, sweeping us into the rapids. For a few harrowing moments, everything was chaos. Water crashing over us, rocks scraping our legs, the icy chill numbing our bodies. We clung to each other, gasping for breath, as the river carried us away from him. Just as I thought we'd escaped, we washed up on a shallow bank, our bodies bruised and exhausted. But there, waiting for us, was the ranger, his face twisted in a look of cruel satisfaction. You really thought you could get away? His voice was a hiss, barely audible over the sound of the rushing river. I staggered to my feet, forcing myself between him and my friends. I was exhausted, every muscle aching, but something inside me refused to give up. You won't touch them, I said, my voice low, each word filled with defiance. He laughed, a hollow sound that echoed through the trees. You don't understand, do you? This isn't a game. This is justice. In a final, desperate struggle, I lunged at him, hoping to buy my friends enough time to escape. We grappled, his hands like iron, as he fought back but I focused on one thing, keeping him away from Sam, Greg, and Maya. Somehow, through sheer determination and a burst of adrenaline, I managed to unbalance him, sending him stumbling back toward the river's edge. With a final push, he slipped, his footing lost as he fell backward into the rushing water. His scream was swallowed by the river's roar as he was swept away. I stood there, breathless watching as the river carried him into oblivion. The silence that followed was deafening. I turned back to my friends, their faces pale, eyes wide with shock and relief. We hobbled back along the riverbank, until we finally saw the familiar trail markers that led us back to civilization. By the time we reached the main trail, dawn was breaking, casting a pale light over the forest, dispelling the shadows of the night. We didn't speak as we made our way back to the ranger station, where we were found by another ranger, one who looked at us with a mixture of pity and horror as we recounted our story. In the end, there was no record of the rogue ranger's name, no missing persons report that matched his description. He was a ghost, a twisted figure, haunting the forest, leaving behind only the memories of those who had been unlucky enough to cross his path. I returned to the forest years later, drawn back by a need to confront the lingering fear. Standing on the edge of the trail, I realized he was gone, swept away by the river, his twisted sense of justice claimed by the wilderness he had once controlled. And yet, as I stood there, I felt the weight of his gaze one last time, as if the forest itself remembered him. A reminder of the darkness that can dwell even in places meant for peace. Next story. In late spring, when the mornings still carried a chill but the days bloomed into warmth, I received an invitation to a wilderness survival retreat. At the time, it seemed like the perfect escape from the pressures and monotony of city life. My closest friend, Tom, forwarded me an email with a link to an outdoor survival workshop, and without much hesitation, we both signed up. 
The program, enticingly named Survival Weekend, promised a challenging yet enriching experience in the wild backwoods of the Appalachian Mountains. Ray Conrad, the instructor, had an impressive resume, over 20 years of experience as a wilderness guide, multiple survival workshops under his belt, and testimonials that spoke of transformative weekends spent in his company. The prospect of learning from someone with such skills thrilled us. I had always prided myself on a decent level of fitness, and Tom shared my eagerness, having just left a grueling desk job for a little soul-searching. We joked that we would either come out of the weekend as wilderness warriors, or as a couple of lost city boys with stories of how we barely survived. The wilderness. We met Ray at the edge of the forest, a few miles away from any paved roads, where he greeted us with a firm handshake, and a gaze that was both assessing and unsettling. Ray wasn't tall, or particularly intimidating in stature, but his demeanor, his quiet watchfulness, and the way he seemed to read people without effort made him feel larger, more powerful. With his rugged face framed by graying stubble and piercing blue eyes, he looked every part the hardened survivalist. Welcome to the edge of civilization, he said, cracking a smile that didn't reach his eyes. Tom and I laughed nervously, assuming he was playing up the wilderness mystique. But looking back, maybe there was more to it than we realized. Ray led us and two other participants, Sarah and Mike, deeper into the forest. Sarah was an adventurous solo traveler, eager to sharpen her survival skills, while Mike was an ex-marine, confident and assured in his abilities. We each carried a small backpack with essentials. As instructed in Ray's welcome email, a flashlight, a few granola bars, and a water bottle. Anything else will be provided the email had said. It had all sounded straightforward at the time, but as we hiked deeper into the woods, I felt a faint prick of unease. The forest grew denser, the canopy above thickening, blocking out much of the sunlight. By the time we reached the clearing, where Ray declared we'd set up camp, it was late afternoon. The towering pines surrounded us like silent guardians, their shadows stretching long across the forest floor. The air was thick with the scent of pine needles and damp earth. This, Ray announced, is where we'll be learning how to survive in the wild. Over the next two days, I'm going to teach you all the skills you need to make it out here on your own. Trust me, by the end of it, you'll look at the world differently. It was an exciting proposition, yet something about the way he said it sent a shiver through me. There was an intensity to his tone a hint of something beyond mere enthusiasm. His eyes lingered on each of us, gauging our reactions. Tom elbowed me, grinning. Think we'll make it, he whispered. I laughed, shaking off the strange feeling that had settled over me. Absolutely. What's the worst that could happen? The first night was simple enough. Ray showed us how to set up lean tos with tarps and fallen branches. Collect water from a nearby stream, and build a small fire to cook the modest rations he provided. Sitting around the campfire, he shared stories from his years as a wilderness guide. The tales were dark and gritty, of climbers who didn't make it down a mountain, of campers who underestimated the wild. Each story was a subtle warning, though Ray's tone held no empathy. He was detached, clinical, as if speaking of animals, rather than people. At some point, Sarah interrupted his story of a stranded couple, visibly uncomfortable. Aren't you afraid of getting hurt, Ray, being out here alone? Ray's response was immediate and unsettling. Afraid? No, Sarah. Fear is something people cling to when they're too weak to face reality. He smirked, staring into the flames, as if reliving each dark moment. Fear is an illusion out here. You survive by being smarter than everyone else. His eyes flicked to each of us as he spoke, his voice low, almost hypnotic. The question isn't whether you're scared, but whether you're strong enough to conquer that fear. That night, as I lay on the cold ground, Ray's words churned in my mind. Fear, he'd said, was something to overcome. And yet, 
the forest seemed to breathe with its own life around us. The trees whispering secrets to each other. I tried to ignore the unsettling feeling growing inside me, telling myself that tomorrow would bring more challenges, and I needed to be well rested. The following morning, Ray gathered us early. Today, he announced, we're doing things differently. His smile was sharp, challenging. No supplies, no guidance from me. Just instincts. He handed each of us a single match, a compass, and a small knife. Survival isn't about comfort, it's about necessity. I'll be watching to see how you adapt. His eyes bore into mine. Today, you're on your own. I glanced at Tom, who raised an eyebrow but nodded, signaling that we'd stick together. Sarah and Mike, however, seemed to accept Ray's challenge with competitive fervor, marching off in separate directions. Tom and I hesitated for a moment, but eventually, we set off, following the compass westward, away from the camp. We figured that by dusk, we'd regroup with Ray and the others, no worse for wear. Hours passed, and with them, my initial confidence began to ebb. The forest was an endless maze, each stretch of trees indistinguishable from the last. We managed to scrounge some berries, though neither of us was entirely certain they were edible. Every now and then, I thought I heard movement behind us, only to turn and find nothing but shadows. The creeping sensation of being watched grew stronger, and I caught myself glancing over my shoulder more often than I cared to admit. Eventually, we stopped to rest, both of us fatigued and beginning to feel the weight of Ray's lesson. What's his deal, anyway? Tom muttered, frustration lacing his voice. This whole survival thing feels more like a test of endurance. I don't know, I admitted. But something feels... off. Like he's enjoying this too much. We pressed on, but the forest seemed determined to keep us wandering. The sun dipped lower, casting an eerie glow over the trees, and just as I began to panic, a rustling sound came from a nearby thicket. I stiffened, pulling Tom closer. From the shadows, Ray appeared, his face unreadable. Impressive, he said, though his tone carried a faint sneer. But it's not enough to just walk, is it? He threw a small sack at our feet. Inside, we found a single granola bar, and half a bottle of water. Provisions, he explained, with a smirk, but only for those who prove themselves. What's going on, Ray? Tom demanded, his patience fraying. I thought this was a workshop, not some sick game. Ray's gaze flicked to him, indifferent. It's survival, Tom. Out here, no one's going to hold your hand. I'm only preparing you for reality. He looked at us both as if we were children missing an obvious lesson. Survival is about pushing limits, testing the boundaries. If you're not willing to go beyond what you think is safe, you'll never truly survive. With that, he vanished back into the trees, leaving us with the dwindling light and a growing sense of dread. Tom and I split the provisions, but they did little to quell the hunger gnawing at my stomach. The doubts creeping into my mind grew stronger. What kind of survival lesson was this? The wilderness was harsh, yes, but Ray's approach seemed cruel, even sadistic. By nightfall, we stumbled upon a makeshift shelter, with a small fire smoldering inside. Sarah sat there, her face pale, and hands trembling. He's watching us, she murmured. I tried to go back to camp, but he blocked my path told me I wasn't ready yet. She looked at me, her eyes wide with fear. This isn't just a lesson. He's playing with us. Our suspicions solidified as we huddled around the fire, uneasy. Ray's words echoed in my mind. Fear, strength, survival. With them, a dawning realization. This was no survival lesson. Ray was pushing us, breaking us down. Not to teach us, but to see how far he could manipulate us. The game was real, and the stakes were higher than I'd imagined. By the third day, sleep had become a luxury none of us could afford. Paranoia gnawed at my thoughts, amplified by the exhaustion. The forest, 
once a vast playground of curiosity, now felt like a claustrophobic cage, every shadow, a lurking threat. I barely recognized myself or my friends. Hunger, thirst, and Ray's twisted lessons had reduced us to jittery, restless versions of who we once were. Every noise, every snap of a twig, sent our nerves spiraling. Ray hadn't made any further appearances, but his presence loomed in every rustle, every faint whisper, carried by the wind. Tom, always the level-headed one, had begun muttering anxiously, glancing over his shoulder every few minutes. Sarah's face was sunken and hollow, her eyes darting as if haunted. Mike had stopped talking altogether. His jaw was set, and fists clenched. Whatever restraint or semblance of camaraderie we once held, had slowly disintegrated. It was late afternoon when the silence broke. A scream, a raw visceral sound that sliced through the air, echoed from somewhere deep in the trees. Without a word, we all took off toward the sound, fear forgotten. We moved through the dense underbrush, each step fueled by dread. We found Mike standing in a small clearing, his hands shaking as he held a piece of paper. It was old, weathered, as if it had been handled too many times. I peered over his shoulder to see Ray's scrawled handwriting. Survival isn't a game. Only the strong will leave here. Show me who you are. A chill settled over us, as thick as the shadows creeping along the forest floor. It was then that Ray appeared, stepping out from behind a tree, as if he had materialized from the woods themselves. His eyes gleamed with an unsettling intensity. Ray, Tom shouted, fists clenched. What is this? We didn't sign up to be pawns in some twisted experiment. Ray's gaze swept over us, indifferent. You signed up to learn survival, didn't you? This is what survival truly is. Hunger, fear, desperation, all the things you're feeling, the suspicion, the tension, there is much a part of this world. They're as natural as the trees in the sky. My stomach churned, both from hunger and a creeping realization. This was no lesson. Ray had brought us out here to watch us unravel, to see how far he could push us. He had no intention of letting us leave, at least not intact. Tom stepped forward, his voice thick with anger. We're leaving Ray, now. Ray raised an eyebrow, a cruel smile twisting his lips. Are you? Because I don't think you understand the rules yet. None of you are ready. You're still clinging to this idea that you're entitled to safety, that survival is something you deserve. He took a step closer his eyes gleaming. Out here, nothing is given, it's taken, and I want to see who among you will take what's needed. A tense silence stretched between us, broken only by the sound of our ragged breathing. Then Ray's smile vanished, replaced by a cold, unreadable expression. Consider this your final test. The last one standing wins the right to leave. The air thickened, charged with fear and anger. And before I knew what was happening, Tom lunged at Ray, tackling him to the ground. The two men grappled in the dirt, fists flying, each struggling for dominance. Sarah cried out, grabbing my arm, but I could only watch. Torn between wanting to intervene, and an urge to let Tom unleash his rage. Ray's voice cut through the scuffle, low and mocking. Is this all you've got, Tom? Some pent-up frustration. With a sudden, brutal twist, Ray flipped Tom onto his back, pinning him with ease. His strength was terrifying, almost unnatural. Enough, I yelled, stepping forward, my voice hoarse. Ray, you're insane. This isn't survival. It's torture. He looked up at me, his expression unreadable. Maybe you're right, he murmured, his tone disturbingly calm. He released Tom who scrambled to his feet, breathing heavily. Ray's gaze flicked between us, a twisted amusement in his eyes. Go ahead, try to leave, see if you make it. With that, he stepped back into the trees. His figure disappearing into the shadows. It was as if the forest had swallowed him whole, leaving us standing in stunned silence. We need to go, 
I said, barely able to keep the tremor out of my voice. Now. Sarah nodded, tears streaming down her face, and even Mike, silent and stoic, gave a grim nod. Together, we turned in the direction we thought was west, hoping to reach the road to escape this nightmare. Hours passed as we trudged through the dense foliage, each step feeling heavier, each shadow lengthening with the setting sun. The forest seemed endless, stretching on and on, indifferent to our plight. We moved in silence, too afraid to speak, too exhausted to care about anything except putting one foot in front of the other. As night fell, we came upon a clearing, and for a moment, hope flared. But that hope was crushed when I saw Ray standing there, waiting, his expression calm, almost serene. Going somewhere, he asked, his voice deceptively gentle. Desperation overtook reason. Ray, please, I begged, my voice raw. Just let us go. We're done. We've learned. Whatever lesson you wanted us to. He tilted his head, a faint smile playing on his lips. I told you before, survival isn't given, it's earned. And none of you have earned it. Mike, silent up until now, stepped forward, fury flashing in his eyes. Enough of your games, Ray. We're done playing. He lunged at Ray, his fists swinging with a desperate fury, but Ray sidestepped him easily, grabbing him by the arm and twisting until Mike cried out in pain. Ray's smile was gone, replaced by something cold and lethal. You think survival is about brute force, Mike. That's where you're wrong. It's about control, about knowing when to strike and when to hold back. With a final, brutal twist, he let go, and Mike crumpled to the ground, clutching his arm. Fear surged in my veins, icy and unforgiving. Ray had no intention of letting us go. This was his world, his rules, and we were mere pawns in his twisted game. I glanced at Tom and Sarah, the realization settling in. If we were to survive, we had to do it on our own terms, not his. Run, I whispered, my voice barely audible. All of us, different directions. He can't follow all of us. Without waiting for a response, I took off into the trees, my heart pounding as I sprinted through the underbrush. Branches tore at my skin, roots threatened to trip me, but I pushed forward, the primal need for survival overriding everything else. I didn't look back, I couldn't. The sounds of the forest swallowed my panicked breaths, my footsteps, until all that remained was the steady rhythm of my pulse and the oppressive darkness pressing in from all sides. But just as I thought I might have escaped, a figure appeared in the shadows ahead, blocking my path. It was Ray, his face an expressionless mask. You didn't learn, did you? I took a step back, my breath coming in ragged gasps. He took a step forward, his movements slow and deliberate. This was it, the final moment, the ultimate test. A sudden noise broke through the silence. Footsteps. Rapid, stumbling footsteps. They echoed from behind, and I turned to see Sarah, her face a mask of terror. She was running straight toward us, and in that moment, I saw a glimmer of hope. Ray was distracted, his gaze flicking toward Sarah. I seized the opportunity, grabbing a nearby rock and bringing it down with all my strength on his arm. He shouted in pain, momentarily releasing his grip, and I took off dragging Sarah with me. We ran blindly through the forest, stumbling, falling, pushing forward until the trees began to thin, and the faint glow of the road came into view. A surge of adrenaline pushed me onward, and when we finally stumbled out onto the asphalt, tears filled my eyes. The sight of an approaching car brought a rush of relief. The driver, a middle-aged man with a look of horror on his face, pulled over immediately ushering us into his vehicle without a second thought. As he sped away, I glanced back at the forest, half expecting to see Ray standing there, watching, but there was only darkness. The drive to the nearest town passed in a haze, 
my mind too clouded with exhaustion and fear to process anything beyond the fact that I was safe, that I had escaped. Sarah sat beside me, clutching her knees to her chest, her gaze fixed on the road ahead, lost somewhere far away. We didn't speak. There were no words for what we'd endured. The driver dropped us off at a small town clinic, and within minutes, we were ushered inside. Nurses and doctors surrounded us, checking our injuries, asking questions. Their voices were calm, comforting, but they felt distant, muffled, as though I were hearing them through a thick fog. When the police arrived to take our statements, the reality began to sink in. I told them everything. Ray's manipulative games, the relentless psychological torture, the twisted lesson he had imposed on us. As I recounted the events, the officers exchanged uneasy glances. It was clear they were skeptical. Stories of survival instructors going rogue weren't exactly common. One of the detectives leaned in closer. He was a heavyset man with a weary expression. You're saying he planned this, that he led you out there to break you? I nodded, my hands trembling. He, he didn't want us to survive. Not really. He wanted to see how far he could push us, to see what we would do when faced with real fear. I glanced over at Sarah, who nodded faintly. It wasn't about survival. It was a game to him, a sick, twisted game. The detective exchanged a glance with his partner, then looked back at me. We'll do our best to track him down. If what you're saying is true, this man is a danger to anyone he comes across. They took our statements and left us at the clinic. We were given a room to rest, but sleep was impossible. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw Ray's face, that cold, calculating smile as he watched us break. I heard his voice, taunting us, daring us to survive. The forest had imprinted itself on my mind, its shadows stretching long and endless, a maze I would never truly escape. In the days that followed, the police searched the area where we'd been taken, but they found no trace of Ray Conrad. It was as if he had vanished into the forest, leaving behind only memories of terror and whispers of a man who played God in the wilderness. The officers said they would continue to search, but part of me knew they would never find him. Ray had become one with the wild, a phantom lurking in the shadows, waiting for his next group of students. In the end, I returned to the city, but life was never the same. I couldn't walk through a park without feeling a spike of anxiety, couldn't hear a snap of a twig without flinching. The forest haunted me, its secrets forever etched into my mind. And sometimes, late at night, I would remember Ray's final words to us. Survival isn't given, it's earned. I knew, deep down, that he was still out there, waiting, searching for the next group to test the next lesson to teach, and I would never forget the cold truth I'd learned in those woods. Survival wasn't about strength or endurance. It was about darkness, about the thin line between humanity and the primal instinct buried beneath it all. And that line, once crossed, left a scar that could never fully heal.